Hi guys! So I am here today to do my July reading wrap up. I read quite a few books in July, some amazing, some not so amazing, and I am here today to give you reviews of all of those books. So I'm going to start with the first book I finished in the month of July and that was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'd started this one in June but I finished off in July and it was a reread for me. It was one of many, many rereads. I have read this book countless numbers of times at this point. I, you know, there was nothing particularly new for me to discover in it, yet I still enjoy it every time I read it as much as I did the time before. I listened to it on audiobook, however, for this first time narrated by Stephen Fry, and he did a fantastic job, which I don't think comes as much surprise, because Stephen Fry is a phenomenal audiobook narrator, and I think his style very much suits this novel. The novel itself, if you're not familiar, is very much a classic science fiction novel. It's also a comedy book. It's hilarious, it's incredibly, incredibly funny and it follows a human called Arthur Dent as the earth is blown up at the beginning of the book by an alien race called the Vogons to make space for a hyperspace bypass where earth is meant to be. And it turns out his friend Ford Prefect is actually an alien and a, a hitchhiking alien at that. So Ford Prefect hitchhikes him and Arthur a lift on this Vogon ship so that they can escape the planet that blows up and then so much other madness happens following on from that. I'll say no more, that honestly happens in the very, very beginning. So there's loads to experience with this story and, you know, five out of five stars every time I read it, really. But then I read a book called Shadowfell by Juliette Marillier. I'm sure you're becoming very familiar with this author on my channel at this point. This is the fourth book I've read by Juliette Marillier in the past two or three months. <laughs> this is the first in a series which has a few books in it. I'll just realise I've ripped the book. Anyway, that's what I get for carrying them around and ba bashing them about. Just shows it's loved. <laughs> um, first in a series, it's a fantasy series. In this case, it's actually set in a sort of medieval-esque Scotland. So uh, two of the others I've read by her were in medieval Ireland. One was in Romania and now this one was in Scotland, which was really nice. It was uh, nice for me. This is not my favourite book by Juliette Merlier, but she has quickly become one of my favourite authors and I adored her other books so much that it's going to be a given that it's hard to compare with that and I still very much enjoyed this one. I think it's aimed slightly more at a young adult audience as in it's more of a young adult novel than an adult novel whereas the adult novels I read by her were like really dense. This one was a little bit more fast paced but I think it still has a lot, a lot of merit and a lot that makes it unique. It's, like I said, set in this kind of medieval type fantasy Scotland and it's full of fairy type creatures. That's what Juliette Marley does really well, sort of the fae and different like fairy creatures, not just your, your bog standard fairy, but kind of the kind of fairies that I think of when I think of fairies, because I think fairies actually covers really eclectic range of magical creatures and they're very much a part of Celtic folklore and she blends that in so well to this. There's this one uh, fairy type monster in it, I can't remember its name, um, I don't know if I can randomly come across it, but it, he was great and he had the best Scottish accent. So a lot of the characters just speak pretty regularly, it's pretty regular English prose. There was this one monster that had the best Scottish dialect and I just, I fell for this little monster, it was so good and that, that always makes me smile. Uh, I really, yeah, enjoyed this one and I will be continuing on with the series. It is, again, like I said, a little bit more fast paced than some of the other Juliet and Marley books I've read. It really, you know, keeps jumping forward but it's an adventure and you get caught up in it. It follows this young girl who has a magical ability to communicate with the fair folk and she lives in a world where magic is essentially forbidden. Um, so she's kind of in hiding and she's trying to find the rebels to join their cause. I then read one of my favourite books of the entire year and that is Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. This was the Feminist Orchestra Book Club read for July, August. So, so the discussion's still going for that one, uh, the Feminist Orchestra being a book club. I run with Lauren over at Reads and Daydreams. You can check it out on Goodreads. And I adored this book. It is so wonderful. Now I'd heard amazing things about it, but sometimes books don't live up to the hype. So you know, I'm glad I finally got around to it though. And I think it's even better than the hype suggests, to be honest. I went into it excited, but 
it blew me away. It's a semi-autobiographical novel, so it is partially based on Jeanette Winderson's own life and her own experiences, although it is technically a fiction book. It's set in the mid 20th century um, in a very working class community in England and follows the main character Jeanette's life growing up as a part of her family and her community and her p Pentecostal church. Um, her family are very religious and her and her mother are very, very much involved in their, their church. However, Jeanette is also gay and sort of discovering her sexuality and her attraction to um, other women and girls and it's about her coming to terms with herself and also the way she is treated by those around her when it kind of comes out that she has been attracted to women, it is the absolute pinnacle of sexism and homophobia but it's amazing, it's so moving and Jeanette Winderson is just a stunning writer. She writes quite strange prose and she can go off on little odd tangents and it's quite whimsical and strange but I love that and I've read three other books by her that I've also absolutely adored. Now there are little tangents in this one, I mean tangents but they're still related to the story in which Jeanette sort of recalls fairy tale type stories and through those stories she's kind of exploring the issues in her own life and I think it's done in a way that it's hard in that environment to really come to terms with and accept yourself and really burrow down deep inside you and explore all those emotions. So she kind of does that through these little fairy tales and it's just stunning. It's such a beautifully written, moving, enthralling novel and I would highly recommend you all go and read it. I then read Ash by Melinda Lowe. This is a young adult retelling of Cinderella but with a lesbian spin. It is so much fun. Now, this one took me a little while to get into and I think the second half was much stronger than the first half. It was kind of slow going at the beginning but by the second half I was completely wrapped up in it and really really invested. So I think I would definitely read more by Melinda Lowe in the future and I'm sure she probably improves even more as a writer and I've heard that her other book Huntress is even better than Ash so I'll definitely check that out. I enjoyed this, it's not my favourite book ever but I did enjoy it and I loved the idea of a gay spin on Cinderella. I did become quite invested in the romance in it and really enjoyed seeing that develop between two of the characters. I thought it was really, really wonderfully done and I think it was a really unique take on Cinderella. She um, added in some elements with the fairies. There was so much more than just a fairy godmother. There was this whole realm of fairies that kind of played with mortals lives and she kind of built that side of the story up more. There was also more built around the court and what was going on in the court and there's these um, people called huntresses. So the royal hunts are always led by a female huntress. So there's that whole uh, cultural side of things. She's kind of built up this fantastical world that she set this book in and I really enjoyed that. It was quite fast paced, just fun adventure reading and I really just enjoyed that take on it. Another fantasy book I read during the month was The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia E. McKillop. This is my second book by this author. I did slightly prefer The Alphabet of Thorn but I still very much enjoyed this one. I think my only reason I enjoyed it less than The Alphabet of Thorn is that I felt slightly more at a distance. I really enjoyed the protagonist of this story whereas I've seen some people didn't in the Goodreads reviews. I thought she was a really fascinating protagonist but she's also quite odd and you feel kind of held at a distance a lot of the time like she's hard to really get into the mindset of because she's quite mystical and different. She is actually a female wizard. She uh, has sort of grown up alone. Her father dies when she's younger who is also a wizard and she kind of just takes care of herself and lives in this um, palace away from the rest of the kingdom with her magical beast. She and her family before her have all had the power to call magical beasts to them. So she has a dragon for example and she lives alone with these beasts until she is given the baby son of the king to look after and that kind of changes her whole life. She then becomes responsible for raising this young boy and everything in her life changes. And like I said, there is a slight distance from the character because she's led such this isolated life. Her personality is quite isolating, but I thought it was very mystical and very imaginative and it's also won fantasy awards in the past because it is a very clever, beautifully written fantasy novel. Unfortunately, I didn't love the next book I read quite as much and I really wanted to but that was Dragon's Bait by Vivian Van Die Velde. A friend recommended this to me and I can totally see 
why someone would enjoy this book and I almost feel like if I'd read it when I was sort of a teenager or a younger teenager I would have really enjoyed it but as an adult I didn't particularly enjoy it because it didn't feel like there was that much depth to it. It almost felt like it was written as a children's book in the style it was written it was very fast paced kind of standard plot elements quite predictable in a sense and had a kind of writing style similar to a children's book and it does have quite large print so maybe it is a children's book but some of the content felt very much like adult content like it was an adult's book so there was a real mishmash of tones there and I couldn't quite get on board with it um yeah so I I read this one to the end it was fine but I wouldn't necessarily tell you to rush out and buy it and that's from somebody who loves dragons. This one is about a young woman who is accused by their villagers of being a witch and is sacrificed to a dragon for being a witch but then ends up kind of making friends with the dragon and striking a, an alliance with the dragon to take revenge on the townsfolk. And yeah it's just a little bit too fast paced and easy and simple and I might have enjoyed it if I'd read it not having read as much fantasy or books about dragons but I think it was just not that amazing and I do feel bad saying that because I wanted to love it and I trust the friend who recommended it to me but these things are bound to happen. Another book I was recommended however is Kumakanda by Kayo Chingonye. This is a poetry collection that everybody's been raving about. It's been shortlisted for prizes, it's won prizes, it has just been lauded by the media and also individuals that I know, individuals on booktube and I had to check it out, I had to find out what the fuss was about. This collection explores various topics, it's got a lot of musical references in it, it's got a lot of references to um, music and listening to music and growing up with music and the poet's relationship with music, lots of re references to Walkmans and cassette tapes which I am part of a generation that grew up with Walkmans and cassette tapes when they were younger as well so I could relate to that. Um, do you even know what a cassette tape is, young people now? <laughs> um, so I like that, although I was never like a massive music lover, so I'm not somebody that really, really identifies with um, the music forming them as a child or a teenager, but I did enjoy this. It also deals with race and racism, nationality, culture, family, grief. So many themes, um, but all strung together really well, and I can see why this poetry collection has received the praise it has. I then read the final book in the Binti series by Neddy Okorafor. This is called Binti Night Masquerade, and what a roller coaster this book was. At one point, I thought it was going to get like a two star rating, I was so furious, and then by the end, I said, This is a five star book. I just was all over the place with this one. I loved both of the first books in the series. I gave them both five out of five stars. And this one took me slightly longer to get into and it very much picks up right where the second book ends. It just keeps going. And I think almost that's why it took me a little bit more to get into because it was like I was just starting in the middle of the book. And then it was an emotional roller coaster. I didn't see where anything was going. It was like this, it was like this all the time. I had no idea what was gonna happen. But by the end, it all just seems like perfection, like it's this beautiful ending to this whole of three books and it makes perfect sense, it works so well and I just, I was so satisfied with it by the end that I, I maybe it's my favourite of the three actually, I loved it. And this series follows Binti who is a young girl from her home who is the first of her people ever to go to Umza University or even leave Earth because Umza University is a university on an entirely different planet and it's about Binti's growth as a human being, how she changes, how she identifies with the culture she grew up with but also perhaps cultures from other members of her family that she wasn't familiar with when she was a child and has come to learn about as well as the new parts of herself that have changed and been discovered from leaving earth and meeting new people and it's such a wonderful character study set in this dramatic exciting science fiction space world and it's so much fun and so worth checking out. I think if you've finished the series and read the third book you will totally see where I'm coming from and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the third book if you have read it because 
Wowzers. I almost chucked this book across the room at one point, except it was on my Kindle, so I couldn't. <laughs> Just two more books, however. The next one is Melmoth by Sarah Perry. This book comes out on the 2nd of October in the UK and is published by Serpent's Tale. This is a proof copy, so not what the final thing looks like, although the final thing looks stunning. This is my first Sarah Perry book. Everybody else loved The Essex Serpent, which either came out last year or the year before. It was everywhere, everyone was raving about it, and I didn't get around to reading that one, however. So when this one appeared in my post, I thought, do you know what, I'm going to check it out. I like the concept. It's a sort of eerie oh, ghost story type, type book. It's primarily set in the contemporary world in the Czech Republic in Prague and follows our main character Helen who is a woman with a past and you don't know what happened in her past but it's something that she very much looks down on herself for being a part of or having done and is sort of paying penance for that by living a life where she's almost self-punishing herself and denying herself any joy because she feels so much guilt over what happened and you find out what that thing is as the book progresses of course and at the same time she's introduced by a friend to this myth or fairy tale of Melmoth who is this ghostly figure that haunts the earth walking round observing witnessing the earth witnessing people doing awful things and then inviting those people that have done these things to come and walk the earth with her for eternity and she's got like bleeding feet constantly she's dressed in black and she's very mysterious but you almost desire to see her as well so as she reads about Melmoth she starts to think she sees Melmoth and she's also reading these documents that were given to her by her friend about Melmoth and historical accounts of Melmoth so one of the most dominant historical accounts in this that you keep going back to is set during World War II in the Czech Republic and follows this young German boy living in the Czech Republic during World War II. So a big chunk of it is set during World War II. There's also a few other historical accounts set in different periods, although those are much shorter than the World War II one. And this book is just very much about guilt. It's kind of about how we deal with our own guilt. Um, can we redeem ourselves after we've done something terrible? Sort of the, the variety of good and bad actions that people can um, commit and kind of where our actions can lead that we didn't intend them to lead. It's a very interesting study on that. I can't say I fell in love with this book. I have to say, I've always said this before, I don't particularly enjoy reading books set during World War II. Can't help it. I don't mind reading non-fiction about it but I've never really enjoyed reading fiction about it and this one ended up being partially kind of a World War II book. But if you do like books set during World War II then you might love this one more than I did. And I thought it was a really interesting concept, but it didn't always work for me. But sometimes it felt like it was trying too hard to make me feel uncomfortable. However, I didn't think it was a bad book by any means. I still enjoyed reading it and I couldn't really put it down. I felt very attached to it when I was reading it and was just going, must finish it, must finish it. Read it in like three days, which is quite quick for me. It's over 200 pages. And I was very much intrigued by it. So I did enjoy it. And I would, would maybe read something else by Sarah Perry in the future to kind of sample her writing, see what else she's done. Um, but yeah, not a new favourite book by any means. <laughs> and lastly, a non-fiction book I read, Asata, the autobiography of Asata Shakur by Asata Shakur, funnily enough. Um, I actually listened to this one on audiobook and would highly recommend the audiobook if you're interested in listening to the, the this book. It is excellent and the book itself is excellent. This was so heart-wrenching, so moving, so interesting. It is about Asata Shakur who was a civil rights activist in the United States of America. She's actually still alive although now she lives in Cuba because she had to flee prison and has lived in Cuba ever since then. She is a political refugee and now in her 80s I believe. She was basically framed for various different crimes by the system, by the police departments of different states for crimes that she could not have done. They were just like there was so much proof against her having been involved in these but there was so much framing going on because she was a civil rights activist and because she was fighting for the freedom of black people from racism and segregation. And the book flits between the time in which she is being tried for this one particular case and all the other cases that are going on in the time as well and overlapping with that one and her treatment in the prison system, her treatment 
by the system and those around her and also her childhood. We get one chapter of her sort of in jail, we get one chapter of her growing up and backwards and forwards and we follow her growing up at the same time until she's sort of at the age that she is when she gets arrested. And she's arrested at the beginning of this book for killing a police officer. Her and a friend were pulled over in a car basically for being black and suffered police brutality. One of the people in the car died and a police officer also died and she's being accused for having killed this police, police officer although there is evidence that proves that she could not have killed this police officer. And it's still so relevant. It's such a relevant book to today. It's so so important a story to hear about and I'm sure there's still so many more people that could get something from reading Asata Shakur's own autobiography and her own experience as a political activist and her treatment by the United States essentially um, and the brutality she faced and what she went through in the incarceration system. It's you know, it's difficult reading, but it's also really engrossing and really, really fascinating and you, you f feel powerful emotions when reading it, to be honest. Um, so I would highly recommend this. But those are all the books I read in the month of July. A nice assortment of different things, I feel. We're not just reading fantasy anymore, although there is still definitely fantasy there. I would love to hear your thoughts on any of the books I've mentioned in this video, whether you've read or not read them, are you interested in, in any of them after hearing me talk about them, please do leave your comments down below. I love chatting with you all. But until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye!